We are live. Welcome everybody to my presentation on parasocial relationship termination, contextual and personality differences in the experience of parasocial breakup distress. I am your host, Liam Cuddy. So first let's talk about what a parasocial relationship is. A parasocial relationship is the one-way relationship that viewers, like us, have with characters that exist within the media. So first let's address what the media is. The media can be movies, it can be television shows, it can be podcasts, it can be content on YouTube, it can be books, it can even be an author of a series or articles. Whatever it is, if they exist in the media and they have aspects of their character that you can identify within yourself and you can relate to these scenarios surrounding their character, their story, etc., you can theoretically form a parasocial relationship with this character. But don't think too hard into what a parasocial relationship is. I'm willing to bet that everybody in this room has or has had a parasocial relationship with a character in the past. So a parasocial relationship implies the existence of a parasocial breakup. So if a parasocial relationship exists, that is, well, parasocial relationships do exist, and that is, like I said, when you have a relationship with someone in the media. And so their doing well, their achieving their goals is reflected in your demeanor. So let's take the context of television shows, which is the context for which we're running this study. We're looking at TV show characters and the relationships that people can form with characters within television series. If you have a parasocial relationship with someone in a TV show and they're doing well, that has been shown through research to reflect in your demeanor. We like seeing our friends do well. We like seeing our connections do well. But then on the other hand, if they don't do well, if something bad happens to them, if something distressing happens to them, that is also reflected in our demeanor and reflected in our psychological processes following that. So parasocial breakups imply the existence of parasocial breakup. I'm sorry, parasocial relationships imply the existence of parasocial breakups and parasocial breakup distress. Parasocial breakup distress is the distress that we feel following the dissolution of a parasocial relationship. So a dissolution of a parasocial relationship is essentially when that relationship effectively ends. So a parasocial relationship can end in a variety of different ways. Again, speaking through the context of television shows, the character could die within the world of the show. Assuming that resurrection doesn't exist within that universe, that character is dead and their character will cease to get developed, therefore your relationship is over. The show could be canceled, thus effectively ending all of the storylines of all the characters. Therefore, your parasocial relationship ceases to exist. You can also stop watching the show on your own volition. Perhaps the show isn't really doing it for you, and you just don't want to watch it anymore, and so you decide, I'm done with that, and you decide to leave that parasocial relationship. So, what's really interesting about parasocial relationships to me is that they mimic the psychological processes of real-world relationships. We are humans, we engage in relationships in very similar manners, even if those relationships are in the media compared to in real life. So real world breakups have mechanisms that we see at play in parasocial breakups. Real world breakups are accompanied by distress. When we go through a breakup, it's typically pretty devastating. It's based on a variety of contextual factors. And the same could be said for parasocial breakups. So that's what this study is examining. What are the contextual factors surrounding parasocial breakups that could exacerbate the stress felt or the distress felt following that breakup. And so we're drawing from research on real world breakups in order to make inferences and in order to make hypotheses or form research questions regarding parasocial breakups. So some mechanisms that are present in both real world breakups and parasocial breakups include locus of control and finality. So locus of control speaks to where the location of control is in the decision that's being made. So to reference real-world breakups, when the locus of control is internal, that means you are the one that is initiating that breakup. You are the one in the position of control. You are making the decision to effectively end this relationship. It's just not working out. You go to your partner, you say, hey, I'm sorry, but this just can't continue to happen, and that is it. You break up, and that can be devastating. Now, even though that's devastating, if the locus of control is external, if you are not in the position of power, if you are not in the position of control, it has been found that you will experience more post-relational distress following a real-world breakup. Now we look at finality. Finality, it could be high, it could be low, and finality is pretty self-explanatory. It is how final 
are the circumstances surrounding your breakup. So a low finality could be seen in the form of going on a break. It's really popular with people in their college ages or young adults. Going on a break is kind of this low stakes way of breaking up. You can go, you can see other people, you can experience other things, but it's always done with the context of, oh, well, perhaps we could reignite this relationship in the future. That's low finality. And people who go on breaks have been found to experience less post-relational distress because the breaks aren't final. There is still that chance at reigniting that relationship. However, if you want to look at high finality, that is the breakup itself. That is not a break, that is a full-fledged, we're over, this relationship is never occurring again, breakup, okay? And when that happens, it is incredibly final, finality is very high, and due to that finality being very high, post-relational distress is typically higher in situations where finality is high and the locus of control is external. So to break this down one more time, when the locus of control is external and the finality is high, the distress following a breakup is going to be very high. Research has shown that that is the circumstances for the highest amount of post-relational distress. But when the locus of control is internal, when you are the one who is in control, and the finality is low, perhaps there's a chance at reigniting this relationship, then the post-relational distress is fairly low. You guys following me? Uh, do I have it? Yeah? Good. Cool. Good. So the scenarios that we're looking at in a parasocial context are going to be character death, the show being canceled, and the viewer stops watching. As I mentioned, when the character dies, the show or your relationship with that character ceases to exist, therefore the parasocial breakup is initiated. When the show is canceled, your relationship ceases to exist, the parasocial breakup initiated, and the same with stop watching. However, when we examine character death, some of the mechanisms in real-world relationships at play are high finality and external locus. So as I mentioned previously in the slide before, high finality and external locus typically yield the most post-relational distress. The same can be said for when the show is canceled. It has high finality and an external locus. Then we look at stop watching. That has low finality and an internal locus of control because you as the viewer are taking the initiative you have the control to refrain from watching the show. So, hypothetically speaking, stop watching. If the viewer decides to stop watching the show, that should yield the least amount of post-relational distress or parasocial breakup distress. So the scales that we're using to examine this are the parasocial breakup distress scale that measures an individual's parasocial breakup distress. How distressed are you after the ending of your parasocial relationship? The parasocial relationship scale, which is how in-depth was that relationship to begin with. The identification of character scale, which is how much did that viewer identify with the character for whom they had the parasocial breakup with. And the retrospective imaginative scale, which speaks to how long the viewer can exist in the world of the show after the show has ended, even though their favorite character whom they had the relationship with has ended, has died, the show's canceled, whatever. How long do they continue to exist within that world, within their imagination? So think about reading a good book and it's over, and you want to keep thinking about the events of that book. That is retrospective imaginative involvement gauges how long you allow yourself to exist within that world. Our first research question is, will parasocial breakup distress differ based on context surrounding the dissolution of the relationship? So as I mentioned, the contexts are character death, the show being canceled, and the viewer stops watching on their own. So my guess, or at least my hypothesis in this case, is that context will play a factor. Context will play a factor when it comes to um, the distress experience of the viewer. We also have moderating factors included in this experiment. So a moderating factor is something that adjusts the magnitude of the effects of the experiment, okay? So the effects that we're looking for is parasocial break of distress. Here, I want to see if attachment style is going to have any sort of impact on the magnitude of the parasocial breakup distress that is felt by the individual. So who's familiar with attachment style? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, cool. Some people are familiar, some people aren't. Attachment style was pretty popular, it's still kind of is pretty popular, um, but it essentially is this psychological concept of sorting people into categories of relationship satisfaction. So it posits that if you are an anxious, ambivalent attachment style, or if you have uh, components of anxious, ambivalent attachment styles linked to your personality, then people have thought that they can kind of differentiate between the type of relationship you should want 
this is the type of relationship you have. It just kind of speaks to how well you work and how you engage in a relationship. And then there's also an avoidant attachment style. And I'm not going to dive too deeply into these, but what's important for you guys to know about attachment style is that anxious ambivalent attachment styles in real world breakup research has been shown to demonstrate more post-relational distress than those who are avoidant. So if you have an anxious ambivalent attachment style and your partner breaks up with you, you are more likely to experience more post-relational distress than you would if you had an avoidant attachment style. So that leads us to our second research question, which is, is the level of parasocial breakup distress experienced moderated by attachment style? Real world breakup distress is moderated by attachment style, and so my guess is that parasocial breakup distress will also be moderated by attachment style. Our next moderating factor is need for affect. Is anybody familiar with need for affect? And yes, I mean affect, not affect, as people like to try and correct me. So need for affect is this concept of emotion and how likely one is to engage in emotion-inducing material. So let's say we have a sad movie or a really sad book or you have a tense conversation with your friend coming up that you know is going to ignite some feelings of frustration. Are you likely to engage with that? Are you going to gravitate towards that? Or are you going to want to avoid that? Are you going to want to shy away? I'm someone who is high in need for affect. If I can watch a movie and it can make me cry, I love that. If I can read a book and it can make me feel something, I'm all for that. If there's a conversation that I need to have that's going to ignite some feelings of frustration, throw me in there. I'm all for that. If I'm not afraid of engaging with my emotions, but there are some people who are less likely to want to engage with their emotions. They would be considered as low in need for affect. That leads 